I'm pleased to introduce Ryan Holiday to Politics and Prose. Holiday is the author of Trust Me, I'm Lying, The Obstacle is the Way, and Ego is the Enemy, among many others. His work has been translated into 30 languages, and his writing has appeared in publications from Columbia Journalism Review to Fast Company. His company, Brass Check, has advised companies such as Google, Taser, and Complex, as well as famous authors and award-winning musicians. In Conspiracy, Holiday unravels an actual conspiracy, not a conspiracy theory, mind you, in which two seemingly unrelated events actually serve as bookends of an almost decade-long plot by Peter Thiel, the Facebook and PayPal billionaire. Michael Lombardi, host of GM Street on The Ringer, declares conspiracy an artful examination of how true power really works and how it affects us all. Now, please join me in welcoming Ryan Holiday. Can I have that? Uh, well, thank you guys for coming. You get to see me in a suit, which is a rare treat, a rare, rare treat other than when I'm getting married. Um, what I thought I'd do is I'll talk for a little bit, and then uh, we'll do questions. Um, the impetus for the book for me, there's a, a line in The Great Gatsby. It's a scene uh, Nick Carraway goes with Jay Gatsby uh, to lunch in New York City, and Gatsby introduces him to his friend, Mayor Wolfsheim, uh, and he says, uh, this is the man who fixed the 1919 World Series. And... Uh, Carraway, this sort of young, idealistic uh, narrator, is, is aghast at this. He, he, he had known that the World Series was fixed, uh, he says, but the idea that a singular person had done it, uh, it shocks him. He says, you know, I knew that it had happened, but I thought it was merely uh, the inevitable result, uh, a, a link in an inevitable chain, right? He, he just thought that these things happened. The idea that a singular person did it, it, it doesn't occur to him. And so uh, this story, the story of Peter Thiel, a, a billionaire uh, wronged by a, a media outlet, uh, a site that many viewed as an unaccountable bully, the idea that uh, when it is shut down in 2016, that there'd been a singular individual responsible for this, that these this 10 years of plotting and scheming had occurred in secret, that no one had, had seen it coming. Um, uh, like, like many people, I, I watched uh, the, the Hulk Hogan trial. I followed the events as it was happening. The, the idea that there was more to this story, it, it had never occurred to me either. And so when Teal was unmasked, I, 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 I thought of that moment in The Great Gatsby. The idea that a single person had been responsible for this chain of events uh, was incredible to me. And then, a, as it happened a, f a few days after uh, this, this had happened, I, I wrote about it, and I got an email from, from Teal himself, and he said, uh, I appreciated your column about the MBTO. That's what he said. I said, what is the MBTO? And he said, the Manhattan-based terrorist organization, which is, what, which is the name that, as a, that he and the, his fellow conspirators had come to refer to Gawker as. Um, and, and we talked, uh, and he began to walk me through what had happened. Um, I happened to also know Nick Denton, uh, who'd reached out to me. He'd read some of my other books. And so here, here I was sort of in the middle of this sort of incredible uh, event. Um, the 1919 World Series was, in fact, uh, rigged in real life. But that's so distant. You know, it, in the early 1900s, weird stuff like that happened all the time, right? We, we, we live in an era where... Almost everything is what it seems, uh, and, and Teal and, and Denton, they both struck me as these sort of larger-than-life characters um, that were more at home in the, you know, the early 20th century or the Gilded Age, um, or, or the pages of Shakespeare. They're these outsized, uh, you know, incredibly um, unusual people. And so I, I thought I would write a book about it, and, and, and I, I ended up reaching out to Robert Greene, who's been a mentor and a friend of mine, uh, a supporter of my work. It's how I got started as a research assistant. Um, and I said, you know, I'm fascinated by this conspiracy. I'm thinking about writing a book about it. And I was like, is there anything you think I should read that I should get started with? And he, he, he said, you know, there's this chapter in, in Machiavelli, uh, in, in his discourses on Livy. He said, there's a chapter on conspiracies. 
um, about people who conspire against princes and how princes protect themselves against conspiracies. And, and I'd, re I'd read discourses on Livy in college, and so I went to my shelf and I pull it down and I find where I'd marked it and I, I, I read it. And it was really interesting. There's a lot, a lot of great stuff. Actually, the organizational structure of the book is based on one of the lines in that, um, in that chapter. Uh, he says, you know, a conspiracy has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a planning, there's the doing, and then there's the aftermath. Um, but a few, a few weeks later, I, I, was, I was in Peter Thiel's apartment in New York City. I was interviewing him, uh, one of the early interviews for the book. And uh, I, I walk into his house, and maybe you guys do this too. Uh, the first thing I do is I snoop at people's bookshelves. Uh, I want to see what their tastes in, in books are. And um, it happens in the corner of his apartment uh, near the window that looks out over Union Square Park. There was... Uh, a, a book and it looked familiar and it was it was discourses on Livy he had the book that had uh, sort of the, the the first book that I looked at when I was researching he had it there on his shelf and I asked him about it and he could reference from memory uh, Machiavelli's advice about conspiracies and the the interesting double meaning of Machiavelli right um, on the one hand Machiavelli is is telling us how to become powerful and yet from what we know from Machiavelli's personal beliefs is that he detested princes. He wanted Florence to be this republic. And so there's this weird double meaning uh, of Machiavelli's work, and, and, and Thiel was sort of aware of that. And so to me, that it sort of made me think this book was faded, that I, that I absolutely had to write it, and, and, and I wanted that sort of double meaning in it, um, which leads me to the, the epigraph of the book. So the epigraph of the book is something that I'd written down about uh, eight or nine years ago, I guess now. Um, it's from Walker Percy's Lancelot. Walker Percy says, I couldn't stand it. I still can't stand it. I can't stand the way things are. I cannot tolerate this age. What is more, I won't. That was my discovery, that I didn't have to. And so to me, this is Thiel's view. He finds Gawker to be both uh, individually repugnant. Uh, they'd outed him as gay in 2007. They'd attacked a number of sort of quasi-public figures in, in, in not exactly cr uh, uh, kind ways. Um, they'd attacked his business interests. Uh, they'd attacked uh, his friend's business interests. He had uh, the, the, a, a number of motivations for doing something about it. And yet, Gawker also represented to him sort of an embodiment of, of, of Thiel's, um, what he, what he feels like he was put on this earth to, to fight against. I, I said to him once, I said, you know, Peter, I, I've heard that Elon Musk believes that his life's mission was to put a man on Mars. What do you think yours is? And he said, the thing that I uh, am here to do is to destroy political correctness. And I said, that doesn't seem that important. Uh, well, what do you mean? And he said, I actually think it's incredibly important. He said, you know, I think innovation and new ideas and insights uh, come from people who think differently, people who are willing to take risks, people who are okay making mistakes. And, and Gawker was really a company, aside from it, it, its, its serious journalistic work, which it, it did do and we, and we have to acknowledge, what Gawker really did was uh, attack people who were easy to attack, right? If you try something and fail, Gawker would be there to make fun of you. If you were weird in some way, Gawker would be there to make fun of you. Uh, if you had weird beliefs uh, or you, ha you kept secrets, Gawker would find those secrets and publicize them. And so Gawker was, uh, in this way, sort of an equal opportunity enforcer of a kind of normalization, a homogenization. Uh, how do we keep things... Uh, because they would make fun of anything and everything, what you wanted to do was be like everyone else so you didn't stand out. And so the Teal, that's what, what Gawker represented and why he decided to sort of put this conspiracy in motion. Um, it, it begins in 2007 when Gawker outs him, and then in uh, an almost Count of Monte Cristo fashion, he waits uh, until 2011 to even begin, to even take the first step in this conspiracy. Uh, I, I describe a scene in the book, uh, 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 an ambitious student named Mr. A meets with Thiel in Berlin, 
and he basically pitches him this idea like a startup. He says, uh, I think I know how, uh, I know you don't like Gawker. I think I know what you could do about it. And he pitches him this plan. He says, you know, I think, uh, I think there's legitimate causes of action that could be taken against the company. And he said, I think it'll take three to five years and cost $10 million. And Teal said, all right, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> Uh, it would be, you know, a, a, a pocket change to him. And, and so uh, the, the next step is they, they hire a, a lawyer. They hire uh, a man named Charles Harder, who at the time was an unknown, uh, if not middling, entertainment lawyer in Los Angeles. And they begin to sort of troll through Gawker's archives. And they're looking, for, uh, they're looking for something to get at them with, some mistake, some line that they've crossed. It's not illegal to out someone. What they did to Teal was uh, if if not a little gross, uh, perfectly within the bounds of, of, of journalism, uh, at, at least as we understand it. And so um, he believed that they may have crossed other lines. Um, he said he, he didn't want to look for First Amendment cases. He said he wanted to look for uh, privacy cases or copyright infringements. He wanted to look for other uh, legitimate violations of, 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 of different statutes in different states. And he wanted to find plaintiffs who were willing to pursue these cases um, Gawker then makes the unforced error of the century in 2012. They run an illegally recorded sex tape uh, of the professional wrestler Hulk Hogan having sex with his best friend's wife uh, that was stolen from his desk. Uh, it, it, that was stolen from uh, a man named Bubba the Love Sponge. This is his actual legal name. Uh, he, had, he, he had offered Hulk Hogan... Uh, uh, his wife, his wife was into it, uh, and what they didn't tell Hulk Hogan is that the the smoke detector on the wall was actually a, a hidden camera, and so they record this tape. It's stolen. Uh, it's leaked to Gawker, um, not because Gawker is a paragon of, of journalism, but because they knew Gawker would run it unthinkingly. That Gawker would not investigate its source or question the motives of the, the, the person who sent them this unmarked envelope. So Gawker runs it. Hogan had threatened to sue whoever would run it. Uh, he, he, he does, uh, he, he, in threatening to sue, he gets Teal's attention. Uh, Teal's lawyers uh, reach out and they say, look, uh, a wealthy businessman uh, agrees that you have been grievously wronged here and we would like to help you uh, in your case against Gawker. That case they thought would be relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, instead, it doesn't even get to trial until 2016. So from 2012 to 2016, uh, they're, they're sort of litigating. Teal is pursuing a number of other cases at the time. Um, there's a detour, there's a conspiracy within the conspiracy uh, that, that, that touches uh, on where we are in current day in that um, the lawyer uh, who represented the person who stole uh, the tapes happened uh, and he attempts to uh, the, he leaks the tapes to Gawker in an attempt to uh, to to gin up interest in and then having Hogan pay him off, uh, and then there's an FBI sting as they attempt to exchange these tapes. But interestingly enough, the lawyer who brokers this uh, arrangement is a man named Keith M. Davidson, uh, who now happens to represent someone named Stormy Daniels, who you may have heard of. Um, and so, uh, as I've been saying in some of the interviews, I think it's an interesting twist. Uh, the, the sting happens, uh, they arrest the lawyer on, on suspicion of extortion. Uh, the FBI ultimately decides not to prosecute, they let him go, uh, and then, uh, and, and then uh, a few years later he's able to extort uh, the man who would then become president of the United States. So Trump doesn't like the FBI for a lot of reasons, uh, most of which are not good, but this is a good reason uh, if they had arrested the man uh, who is essentially a professional extortionist we wouldn't know the name Stormy Daniels, uh, or she certainly wouldn't be in the news today. So the case is a, a lot of sort of twists and turns, which I talk about in the book. And then uh, it gets to trial. And Gawker had not taken this case seriously. Um, I think at the most simple level, um, Gawker as a media outlet was convinced that this was an issue of the First Amendment. And that's how they attempted to litigate the case. We're allowed to publish whatever we want. Uh, we're a news outlet. We don't really need to defend this. Uh, why are you bothering us with this? Why do we have to go to Florida again? You know, that sort of thing. And, and what was so genius about uh, the way that they'd approached this strategy <clears throat> on Teal's end is that it, it fundamentally wasn't a First Amendment issue. 
It was a privacy case. <clears throat> is the media allowed to publish material uh, recorded in the privacy of one's bedroom that has no significant newsworthiness? And uh, since Gawker was not really able to argue that there was much newsworthiness in the tape, in fact, in their deposition, they had flat out admitted that there was no newsworthiness of the tape because they didn't think they really needed to uh, defend it. And so uh, this moment in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in Florida is, is sort of the awakening. Oh, we've massively misread this. Uh, we've misread this case. Uh, this is about to get real. The verdict comes down, it's $140 million, and, and it's a, a, essentially a financial death penalty for Gawker. He almost gets away with it until he's, uh, he's unmasked a few months later. And so what I thought was so interesting about this case is that we, we live in a world, <clears throat> and Teal would say this, we live in a world of conspiracy theories, but of very few actual conspiracies. And of the conspiracies that we can more or less prove, very little in the way of admission from the people who were involved in it. And so here, what I thought I had the opportunity to do and what I tried to do in the book is show how a conspiracy works, what, 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 what forces them into existence, what motivates them, how, they, how it actually works as a, <clears throat> excuse me, how it actually works as a methodology. And then <clears throat> what are the unintended consequences of a conspiracy, right? The fundamental irony of this conspiracy <clears throat> is Thiel embarks on it because he wants to protect his privacy because he's uh, uh, opposed to cyberbullying, let's say. These are his, his stated reasons. And at the end of it, he's massively more famous than he was when he started. And uh, Trump is in the White House. Uh, uh, and, and so it, uh, it, it's almost this... Uh, this uh, poetic irony that, uh, you know, it, does it make things better or does it make things worse? That's like one of the questions I think the, the, I tried to leave hanging in the book. And I'm not sure I necessarily have the answer. I could venture to guess, but I'm not sure I do. And that goes to the epigraph that I was, uh, I was, I read earlier. What so Lancelot is, is this, uh, wonderful Walker Percy novel. Walker Percy was a sort of inherently conservative, uh, you, you might even say reactionary uh, Southern writer uh, who was sort of aghast at the immorality of his age. There's a line in the book, he says, the mark of the age is that everything is awful, but there is no evil in it. He found, he thought that sort of society was in decline, that intellectualism was on the decline, but that no one was really responsible for it. And you couldn't, you couldn't point at it or name it. He just had this sort of vague sense. And so the, the, the premise of Lancelot is that this man goes on a quest uh, for good against evil. But the end of the novel, not to spoil it, although everyone should go buy it, uh, is that he ends up burning down his own house and he nearly kills himself and does, in fact, you know, kill his family. It's a terrible, the book is also a tragedy, right? And so I think what, what, I, what I found in, in this conspiracy is that there was much to admire in its sort of effectiveness and brilliance and creativity, um, perhaps even some, some noble motives, depending on where you, where you sit on, on Gawker and Teal. And yet there's also a, a sense that um, its, its result is ambiguous. Gawker no longer exists, uh, but is the world a, a better place? Is, uh, is the internet better or cleaner? Uh, are we getting along better? Um, is that because uh, it was ultimately ineffective or is that because it took too long and it was too late, right? So there's all these, these questions and, and I'm not sure there's clear answers, but I, I wanted the book to be a meditation on, on, on those themes. And, and uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. I think one of the, well, the, the thought I would close with, I think the central question of the book is who was the bully, right? Uh, is the bully the billionaire who shuts down the media outlet? Or is it the media outlet that thought they could do whatever they want, wanted to anyone they wanted to and that there would never be any consequences, right? Is it, is it a billionaire spending $10 million uh, to fight this case uh, that's alarming? Or is it a media outlet spending tens of millions of dollars litigating this case because they believed it would never actually get to a jury? They believe that they could spend so much money that eventually they, they thought they were fighting Hulk Hogan, right? Rocker didn't spend a lot of money because they thought they were 
fighting Peter Thiel. They spent a lot of money because they didn't think Hulk Hogan could afford to actually get this case to a jury. Um, at Thiel, when he spoke at the, the press club um, uh, a few, a few uh, months before the end of, of 2016, he said, um, he said, and this is something I guess only Peter Thiel uh, and, uh, could say, he said, because Hulk Hogan was only a single digit millionaire, he was effectively denied access to the American legal system. And in, in some ways that's true. Um, Hulk Hogan, in a case that he ultimately won, would have been actually unable to win had he not had the help of the billionaire. So who is the bully? Is, is Teal leveling the playing field or is Teal making the playing field incredibly unfair, right? And who is, it, who is the bully? Is it the one, is it the media outlet that, that outs people that, um, publishes sex tapes uh, that they know were recorded without people's consent, uh, that, that regularly attacked and, and sort of treated people as if they weren't people? Or is it the billionaire who held this grudge, who wanted to make someone suffer, uh, who ends up backing uh, Donald Trump in the presidential election, right? I, again, I, I think you could argue it either way. Um, and, and, and so I, I think part of, the, part of the book for me was, was to, to pose those questions I, I think uh, what I can conclude with is the is the what, what to go back to this Nick Carraway line. What was so interesting to me is here was a case that was covered by every major media outlet multiple times. Uh, no one suspected that anything was going on uh, below the surface. No one delved any deeper. No one attempted to really answer these questions. Everyone saw it one way, uh, which was that at first it was just a tawdry celebrity, uh, you know, bit of embarrassment. It was salacious tabloid news. And then when Teal was unmasked, it was immediately seen as, you know, the rise of Silicon Valley, the abuses of power, you know, the, the perils of having a billionaire class. But in fact, I think the whole issue is much more complicated and that depending on where you look at it on which day, it can totally change your view. And so that was certainly my experience writing it you know, I think I, immer I, I went into it with some preconceived notions, and I think I came out of it with all of those preconceived notions turned upside down. And, uh, you know, I'd be writing it on a Tuesday and I'd feel one way, and I'd be working on it on Wednesday and feel totally different. And, and, and so I, I could see it both ways. And so I wanted the book then to present this, to leave the question to the reader, uh, to, to you guys, to leave you guys... Uh, the opportunity to make your judgment, but only after you'd gotten the actual facts from the actual people who were there. And uh, I, I have in the conclusion a, a line from Margaret Atwood in one of her one of her poems. She says, uh, "She the poem is from the perspective of a military historian uh, who's writing about these bloody battles." And she says, um, "I choose to deal only in tactics. Right? A historian doesn't judge." They simply present what happened and leave the reader to conclude. And so that's what conspiracy is about. I appreciate you guys all coming. And we can do questions. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, hi, Ryan. It's um, great to be able to ask you a question personally. I remember reading you back in the Rudius Media days. So oh, that's um, awesome. I go pretty far back and yeah. uh, reading your stuff. Uh, I finished the book. I thought it was really fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed reading it. Thank you. <clears throat> One thing I was kind of left with, um, and all the things you talked about, all the questions that you kind of posed, going yeah. back to reading things like uh, "Trust Me, I'm Lying," mm -hmm. um, you say things like about the man meeting meeting the guy who rigged the 1919 World Series, and here we are a century later, and essentially, you know, yeah. these conspiracies will still kind of happen. Now, do you think that means we haven't really progressed in a hundred years? And what? I mean, I mean, I'm not sure we've progressed that much in two thousand years. Like, uh, you know, that I think that's the fundamental point. Uh, that I'm, I'm trying to look at, at all conspiracies throughout history. Not conspiracy theories, but, you know, I had to do this show Coast to Coast. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, uh, but it, it, it's basically on from like 2 to 4 in the morning, and a lot of truckers listen to it. Uh, but it's all conspiracy theories, right? You know, when I was listening, one guy uh, asked me my opinion on um, whether I thought aliens caused the uh, 1918 influenza epidemic. Spanish flu. Like, yeah, the yeah. Spanish flu. Uh, so that's a conspiracy theory, right? That's preposterous. But the idea that powerful people uh, attempt to bend the world in the direction they want it to go, or that 
uh, that uh, if you attack someone, they may attack you back, or that uh, you know just the the law, the fundamental law of the universe that actions often have consequences. Yeah. That I don't think has changed and ever will change. And the message of the book is is about those things. And I guess a brief follow up question. I mean, like with all of the misinformation you kind of cover, and trust me, I'm lying. And I mean, uh, yeah. the commoditization of facts is revolutionary access to information, and we're always trying to out people. Is it harder to pull off a conspiracy today, do you think, than it was maybe 100 years ago? Or? Well, uh, Teal, Teal told me that when they started this, they were really worried that someone was going to catch them. That they, they you know, uh, and Machiavelli talks about this. When you're doing something conspiratorial, you suddenly think everyone's talking about you all the time. That there's all these eyes on you. And Teal realized, he said about halfway through, that no one was even paying attention. Um, he said there was this interesting question. Uh, you know, Charles Harder, the lawyer, doesn't know who his backer is. He's yeah, interacting yeah. with this intermediary, Mr. A. And, and so uh, Teal, Teal said, I wonder who Charles thought I was. And then he said, I realized after a certain point that he probably thought I didn't exist and that Mr. A was the actual like that, so we have this we 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 we've I think become almost more naive or we're so busy and so overwhelmed that we don't have the ability to think deeply about these things. So he, I think his point was it's actually easier to pull off because what is it, he says what does it say that an investigative media outlet is not able to investigate a conspiracy yeah, on them. which their entire yeah. <laughs> existence depends? And I think that goes to the larger point that we're not really paying attention. Awesome. Thank you, man. Of course. Thanks for the question. Teal is pretty openly contemptuous of, I think, most people, most prominently in his remarks that women should be denied the franchise because they're too stupid to be libertarians. Um, you see this in his academic Straussianism as well, where the general idea is people are too dumb to govern themselves. And he's been very open. You see this um, comments in the Stanford Review and otherwise about thinking that there are, about thinking that there's kind of a public face to what he says and what he actually believes. Again, mm -hmm. most prominently in his idea that his apologies for some of his anti-political correctness remarks, for example, again, the Stanford Review when he was on campus talking about how the people who are really discriminated were the people who were not allowed to use words like, I, don't, I guess, the F word for homosexuals. I don't know mm -hmm. how properly to say it. And I guess what I'm asking is, why do you trust Teal if he's so open in saying that I think the public are dumb and I think they need to be lied to? Him? Why do you trust him as a source in doing this? Or do you trust him in a, as a source in doing this? <coughs> I, I, I don't perfectly trust in anyone telling me anything in this story and so part I, I mentioned that in the book you know um, uh, for instance they, they sort of dance around their involvement in Gamergate they'll talk kind of on the record kind of not on the record uh, yeah e each side in this event is trying to present themselves as the, the righteous side of things Gawker has a sort of a lost cause mythology and Peter has sort of a a heroic narrative that he wants to do. And so what I attempted to uh, present was what actually happened as I could deduce it from interviews, court documents, events, my understanding of how these things actually work. So I don't perfectly trust any of the narrators. Um, if there are, uh, you know, uh, a, a certain biases from Teal that are passed on through his quotes, I think the larger truth of what I was trying to say not in a journalistic sense, but in a historical sense, is there in the book. But I would push back on the libertarian remark, and I think the libertarian uh, you know, women can't uh, cast, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't get the right to vote, because it actually goes to, I think, part of Thiel's motivation. I, I, I saw the reports about that comment when it came out. I remember it. I thought, you know, what a stupid thing to say. What are you talking about? And then as I was writing that section of the book, I, I'm going to really sort of pour over this article. What is he saying? What he was simply saying, uh, and I don't think this is controversial, is that, is that uh, the, uh, the enfranchisement of women has not been good for the libertarian cause. Not that women shouldn't be able to vote. What he was saying is that uh, there are not a lot of female libertarians, and so therefore that cause has not been particularly popular. So uh, does that make sense? His, his remark was a factual remark that if you're tracking the popularity of libertarianism, uh, that was a blow to it. I don't think, he, I don't think what, what happens in our media culture is that we then, uh, one headline implies something and then another picks up on that headline and so on and so forth until the next, it, that gets simplified to 
Peter Thiel thinks women shouldn't have the right to vote, which is objectively not what the intention of that remark is. And ironically, that also is what happens in this case, right? There's a, 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 a moment in the depositions where the editor of Gawker uh, jokes, uh, is asked what kind of sex tape uh, he wouldn't run, and he says, of a child. Uh, of a celebrity sex tape he wouldn't run, and he says, of a child. And then they say, well, what's the cutoff? And he says, I don't know, four. But then over the course of the media coverage, when that uh, remark is made public, and then uh, it, when he's put on the stand, um, it, the shorthand becomes, uh, you know, child pornographer. Gawker thinks it's okay to run a sex tape of a five-year-old. Now, I'm not saying it was a good remark, because I'm not saying Peter Thiel's remark is good. It was stupidly worded and, and, and not particularly, uh, uh, not a particularly insightful point either. But that is fundam it's fundamentally different to say that he thinks women shouldn't have the right to vote, just as it's fundamentally untrue to say that A.J. Delario uh, thinks that the cutoff for running a celebrity sex tape is five years old. So I was wondering if um, at some point Teal thought that he had succeeded too well. And, it, and in that sense saying, um, was it his intent to actually destroy Gawker or was it the intent to to make the the point or or wound Gawker and and say yeah. you know you've gone too far too far with the with the with with the invasion of privacy and if he even if regardless of his intent whether he would have been better off if Gawker had been given a substantial litigation and and uh, emerge, jury judgment but, but not emerge. but emerge but yeah. emerge yeah. because i mean i wasn't a fan of gawker sure. before gawker i thought gawker was repulsive when gawker existed when i when gawker was destroyed i mourned gawker because i mourned what that meant so i i think that's a great question um i i think it, it's it's a number of things so i think on the one hand i do think he was explicitly attempting to neutralize them as a media outlet. Um, but he was attempting to do so through legitimate means, right? So he, he could have uh, filed a number of frivolous lawsuits and, or, or so many lawsuits that eventually they just sort of died under the uh, onerous legal burden of, of having to defend themselves. He wanted what he said, um, he wanted a knockout blow. So I don't think he just wanted to wound them. And, you know, at one point, Gawker offered more than $10 million to settle the case, which would have been a subs uh, not a bankruptcy uh, level event, but substantially damaged them. The brand, it would have sent a strong message. And, and Teal uh, doubles down then and goes, no, I want this to go all the way to a jury. And then even after he'd had uh, a, a number of uh, mock trials that showed how high the verdict would be, he nevertheless files or supports the filing uh, or backing of other cases. So I think he wanted to go all the way. I think what he didn't realize is that, you know, this question, who is the bully? Um, Gawker was the bully up until the verdict was rendered, as you said. And then as soon as you're driven out of business, you're immediately sympathetic. And so Gawker was this sort of outsider in the media circles until they're put out of business and then immediately they're welcomed back in the tribe as the, you know, as the, um, as the proverbial w victim. And so I think that, I think what he overestimated or what he underestimated or didn't understand is that Gawker became the underdog as soon as they lost and he became the bully. Uh, and, and that, that wasn't factored into his calculation. Hi Ryan, thanks for coming here tonight. Really appreciate your thoughtful writing. Thank you for coming. I had to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I've been interested to hear is uh, I'd be interested to hear what the reaction has been from the two major protagonists in yeah. your story as to as to your characterization of the book. I know in the book you talk about you're, you're working out all the way up until the end yeah. and you're sort of working through yeah. it, so I'd be interested to hear how that went. Yeah, I mean, so neither of them have sued me yet, so I guess that's a good <laughs> sign. Uh, although Charles Harder asked for a copy of the book a, a few weeks before it came out after he uh, you know, sent a, a letter on behalf of uh, Donald Trump to Michael Wolff's publisher. So there were some scary moments. Um, a, as far as I've, I've understood it, uh, uh, Nick uh, hasn't read the book, but he's read articles about the book. And he and I have talked a few times since. 
So I guess that's, you know, you can t read that however you want. And uh, Teal and I have talked a few times since, uh, and I think he generally, I think he's, he's actually quite proud of what he's done. You know, he calls it the most philanthropic thing he's ever accomplished or, or, or done. And so I think he enjoys the, I think he takes, he reads the characterization one. It's like he reads the characterization probably as a hero story. And Denton probably sees it as a, you know, uh, an expose of power. And that's sort of my intention is that depending on where you sit, you can see it different ways. Yep. Do you have any thoughts about the long-term impact that this conspiracy will have on journalistic freedom, on the First Amendment? Um, and have you seen any behavior modifications in the media at this point, just a couple years after? Yeah, I, I actually think, I think the precedent of this is much less than people, the, the legal precedent of this is much more contained than people think. Uh, the reason that Teal didn't sue uh, The Atlantic or... Uh, Bloomberg or the New York Times is that they don't run surreptitiously recorded sex tapes to celebrities. They might write about them, which Gawker was free to do. They wouldn't actually run the tape. And, and so before Teal's involvement was, was revealed, most legal experts felt that the precedent was relatively constrained. It's only after the billionaire's involvement uh, was revealed that it takes on a different shape. But the event is the same, right? So it's not like he, in, it's not like he invented litigation finance either. I mean, there's tons of groups based here in Washington that do nothing but litigation finance on behalf of, you know, causes they believe in or, you know, uh, if your rich uncle wanted to fund, uh, you know, a case on your behalf, should that be illegal? I don't think so. So um, I think the precedent is relatively limited legally. Culturally, I think it'll be interesting, you know, does he inspire, uh, you know, other wealthy individuals to sort of try to make things happen behind the scenes, maybe? Or has the backlash, the cost of what this was to his reputation and his legacy, at least in media circles, does it deter uh, people from taking risks like this? So I, I don't know. Hey, Ryan, I, I haven't read this book yet, but I've read, you know, The Obstacles of the Way, Thank you. Uh, Confessions of a Media Manipulator. And I think in those books, it was very uh, case study based. Uh -huh. So you would write about different things that happened. Uh, but in this book, it seems like you're writing about only one thing, right? Kind of. So I guess, please talk to us about your evolution as a writer and a thinker as to what led you to expand on one large event. Well, um, I, I don't think the difference between this book and the other books is that the others are case study based and, and this one isn't. It's that the other books were either about my personal experience, which is relatively easy to write about. I mean, I know myself, right? So I can write about that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, everyone in the obstacles, the way, and ego is the enemy for the most part is dead. Uh, and uh, the issue is relatively well established, whatever I'm talking about. And I'm not uh, obligated to go in any sort of chronological order, right? I can just tell stories as I see them and fit them wherever I want them to fit. What was different and much harder about this book was to tell a singular story from beginning to end, being constrained by the actual events of what happened um, and, and in the order that they happened. But I did try very deliberately to weave in stories from history and current events and, uh, and, and literature to, to sort of contextualize these and, and allow there to be lessons and, and sort of practical advice and case studies if you will. Hey, Ryan. Also a huge longtime fan. Thank you. Um, Obstacles Away is my all-time favorite book. Your newsletter each month on books has introduced me to like a whole new world that I've never read, so thank you. Yeah. Before I sound like more of a fanboy, I'm also wearing like a Daily Stoic necklace. Oh, so cool. Just say that you've had a big impact yeah, on my life, so thank it. you. Thank you. Um, obviously, this book is, as the previous speaker just said, like a big change in direction. And when I dove into it, I was fascinated. And I found myself thinking, you know, what would have changed the perception of this that it may not have been a big deal at all. And I kind of landed on three questions okay. of three events. If they had changed, what would have happened? Because I think you said like a thousand things had to go right for this yeah. to line up perfectly. One was if AJ didn't make the joke in his deposition, yes. if the perception of him would have changed overall and mm -hmm. Gawker could have seemed more sympathetic. Two was um, if the whole tape of Hogan hadn't released, including all of the racist remarks that he made. The whole tape didn't Oh, sorry, the, the remarks yes. of it hadn't yeah. leaked, so uh -huh. people didn't essentially see all the racist things he said that led to his personal fallout. Yep. Or three, not that 
another billionaire would have necessarily done this, but a billionaire that may not be so polarizing as Teal. Yeah. Like pick anyone, like sure. you know, extremes, if Warren Reed Buffett Hoffman or someone else, or Reed Hoffman. Yeah. If they had funded it, do you think this would be as such a big deal as it is now? Yeah, I think those are good questions. I uh, I think those are pivotal moments. To me, though, the the if we're talking about what, how how would this have happened differently or not happened, the pivotal moment, and and you know, I have I think the second chapter in the book is the decision to act, right? The decision to do something. Um, that's the ulti- That's the moment that all the other pivotal moments pivot on, right? The Teal uh, feels slighted. He feels frustrated. He feels unable to do anything about this or, or he despairs of uh, of the status quo a, a site could thoughtlessly out you um that one has no recourse uh that 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 this outlet will run you know rumors and gossip in, in the way that gawker did um everyone told him not to do anything they said just let it go like just have thicker skin move on live your life uh or they said there's nothing you can do about it but you know that they're they're protected in this way. There's you know there's no there's no option. I think the pivotal moment is that Teal uh, decides to act. Um, his friend Eric Weinstein I talk about in the book has this idea of a high agency person. What does a person do when they're told there's nothing you can do about it? A high agency person tries does something anyway, right? And I think Teal is that person. He he said that it took him a while to get there, but that's where. He, so to me, that's the pivotal moment of the whole thing. Hi. Um, Hi. Something I keep thinking about in the book is the way you describe Hulk Hogan yeah. being led into the house yeah. by a hand. And it was so tender, this moment, the way you <laughs> wrote about it. But um, I think this is a part of American culture. I don't totally understand the wrestling yeah. shock DJ and they were these uh-huh. friends. You know, I, don't know, I don't either, yeah. Yeah, but maybe what did you learn about Hulk Hogan or what led you to write about, you know, so tenderly because he's got this bigger than life personality. Yeah. Uh, well, I met him. So I interviewed him for the book. He, we, we, I interviewed him in the same hotel that the FBI sting had happened in. Uh, you know, he came to my room and, cause that's where he wanted to do it. And, uh, like he showed up in a shirt with a picture of Hulk Hogan on it. <laughs> so on the one, on the one hand, he's sort of this outsized ridiculous personality. Uh, he left me a voicemail the other day. And the text of the voicemail is like, I think he says, he said, Holiday Mania, Hogan brother, give me a call. <laughs> and so I got that transcription on my phone and I, I, I thought, well, that's obviously like just some garbled thing. It's not a real transcription. And I listened to it and that's exactly what it said. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, he's this outsized personality. When I met him, he was like a dis- an incredibly sort of tender, simple sounds very condescending, but like just an ordinary person. And I think... Part of what Gawker's coverage was defined by was the the loss of that fact that like Hogan is a cartoon character, Hogan can't feel pain. Let's laugh at this. Like the idea that this would have been a humiliating moment. That okay, yes, it's super weird you're having sex with your best friend's wife. But does that lots of people are in open relationships? Does that mean that they're entitled to also be illegally recorded while doing so and then leak? So I, I was just, I, I really tried to, as someone who's also been written about by Gawker and not flattering ways, I really tried to put myself in the shoes of a person that goes through this dark time in their life, does this thing, and then uh, five years later is humiliated in front of seven million people. Um, what would that be like? And that's what I tried to capture in the book. I, I personally don't understand shock jocks. I've watched very little professional wrestling. I tried to relate to him just as a human being. And I think fundamentally Gawker's failure to do that is why they didn't take the tape down, why they didn't apologize and settle this case early, and why they so misread how the jury, who the jury was going to side with when the case got in front of them. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. So we've been talking a lot about how Pierre Thiel was the victim and how he did something about it and you know tried to change the outcome. I'm curious what lessons you learned about being the victim of a conspiracy. I suppose just yeah. like in Gawker's sure, sure. shoes, like you know, talk a lot about like you know obstacles away. Is the conspiracy the way? You know, yeah. is it like just to yeah, yeah. go I don't, through it? And to, I don't know if I would say I think Peter Thiel is the victim. Sure. What I would say is Peter Thiel thought he was the victim, mm, which is really okay. what matters, right. right? What matters is why did this person do this? What was mm. their point of view? Okay. So. We make that stipulation. Sure. But um, the reason Nick and I connected is that when his life is turned up, again, 
whether he deserved it or not is a separate thing. Right. Uh, but when one day you own a $300 million company and you have 300 employees, and then the other day you have to rent out your apartment on Airbnb uh, to cover your mortgage because you have to declare personal and professional bankruptcy, that is also a dev like you have to relate to that person as much as you relate to Hogan. And so um, he turns to stoic philosophy mm -hmm. as people often do in moments of, you know, adversity and personal devastation. And so I think he, it just rocked his world completely. And so, uh, you know, I have a line in the conclusion uh, from Robert Caro where he says like a biographer has to, a biographer who writes about power has to talk about the man who wields the sword and also who it's wielded against. Mm. And so I tried to capture, particularly in the aftermath, what it would be like, you know, AJ on the stand, like he took the full brunt of something that he didn't create, that he would like, if the tape had come to a different Gawker writer on the same day, they would have run it and he would have, you know, not been a victim. Uh, you know, he mm -hmm. would have not been a victim of the conspiracy. So mm. I think um, I, I did try to think about that a lot. And so I, I'm not saying, you know, everyone should start a conspiracy. But <laughs> what, what I was trying to say in the book is like, let's think about these people and their motivations. And right. then you can take whatever lessons yeah. you want. Because it seems more relatable to be like the victim of power, like coming yeah, of against course. us rather than like, I'm going to be a billionaire one day and just and look, you know, Ga Gawker way. made ensured its own victimhood mm -hmm. by never taking this seriously, never taking responsibility for anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's arrogance and hubris is what caused. So, so I also see it that way. Like yeah. Teal was uh, brilliant and ruthless, but Gawker was also arrogant and stupid in how they fought the case. And mm -hmm. so it, those two things are uh, related and probably equally responsible for the verdict. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Hey, Ryan, uh, Darshan here, huge fan. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Awesome event. Um, so I know you uh, talked to a lot of sports locker rooms, New England Patriots, Seattle Seahawks. Yeah. And right now with uh, March Madness, I can't help but think of like with these uh, games where the 13 seed potentially like beats the yeah. four seed and the relationship between ego and um, stoicism with sure. these uh, sort of teams that aren't necessarily supposed to be there and how yeah. they sort of take down uh, Goliath, if you will. You speak to that. Yeah, no, I think those games are, are fascinating as well. I mean, uh, if the if if one team thinks it's unbeatable, it makes itself very beatable. And if the opponent, you know, the, the hungry opponent thinks they have a chance to win, it creates the possibility that they can win. And so it's a, it, I think it's a sort of uh, balance of humility and confidence that and you know depending on where they align. I mean, like the story of boxing is the same story, right? Heavyweight champion gets complacent, is beaten by uh, a challenger uh, who, who, who works extra hard, who believes they've got a shot, and then they become the complacent challenger. And so this is sort of the cycle of, of life and sports, and I think that's why they're helpful metaphors to, to learn from and study. Hey. Hey, good to see you. Yeah. Um, so I was, I've been reading a lot on Peter Thiel, just kind of related to the book. I've, yeah. I'm just started the book, so. All right. Okay, I'll finish it. I will um, hold it against you. <laughs> Read all the other ones. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I stumbled upon uh, Rene Girard, who I yeah. guess was an influence on Peter Thiel. Uh -huh. And he writes about religion, specifically like mythology, and how yeah. like in ancient mythology, um, a lot of the stories resolve like you defeat the, you know, whoever the perpetrator is, and the whole village is like angry about them, yeah. and they defeat them. And it's like this violent end. Yes. And only in Christianity is there's like forgiveness and yeah. like some sort of like um, res resolution. So I guess I'm just kind of curious like kind of what your thoughts are on that, just because it seems like conflict is kind of the only way right now, or that's just yeah. human nature, ex minus this kind of exception. Yeah, uh, Gerard is, I, I think, brilliant, is a huge influence on Peter, incredibly difficult to understand. I probably understand it, uh, you know, very superficially. I think it's really interesting. His, uh, the book I would probably start with, if anyone's interested, is uh, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, uh, which is a biblical verse, I guess. Um, he believed that every, that people are mimetic. So he said that we don't know what we want, so we want what other people want. And this creates conflict, right? You see someone doing well for a specific reason, and you go, that's what I want. And then that puts you in conflict with that person. Um, and so in some ways, there's a mimetic conflict between Teal and Denton. Uh, they're both gay, both immigrants, both libertarians, both controversial. Uh, and one is more powerful than the other. Like, Teal is richer than... Denton, and that's why Denton doesn't like Teal, and uh, Denton, or Denton is more powerful and well-known than Teal, and that's why Teal doesn't like Denton. 
uh, and they get in conflict with each other and only one emerges. Um, and it's like they were both scapegoating each other, to use uh, Gerard's term. Uh, his, his point is that sort of Christianity is the remedy to this endless cycle of violence uh, that, that you know, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to learn from the story of Jesus Christ they immediately regret the scapegoating of Jesus, right? And that's that's the the myth of or the, that's the moral of Christianity is is, is an end to, to that cycle. Um, I don't know necessarily how that fits exactly into the story. Um, I guess Teal's point was uh, that this sort of legal conflict, uh, you know, through the court system, where there's some element of justice at the end, rather than a sort of endless personal feud, or you know, in a uh, hundred or two hundred years ago, uh, Denton would have libeled Teal in a newspaper, and then, as and this happens in the Count of Monte Cristo, then Teal would have challenged Denton to a duel, and you know, like that. So the, the, I think his point, or uh, I guess the Green Prize, this was a better, less violent alternative than to go to the first question of like, have we changed? We haven't changed, but at least we've created these channels with which to direct that energy that are slightly less destructive than physical violence. So that's a weird note to end on, but we'll do it. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it.